Hey, good people, Batavia here. So I want to share one of my all-time favorite vegetables to grow, collard greens. I'm gonna take you back to when we planted them earlier in the spring to where we are now throughout the growing season. Uh, we have made it to fall, mid-fall-ish, and this is probably gonna be the last sizable harvest of the season. And then I also have a tip on how to manage your harvest when you're not ready to manage your harvest. All right, so quick housekeeping items. Thank you to those who like, watch, comment, share, and subscribe to Be Better Garden. I appreciate you. If you haven't subscribed already, consider it. And we're gonna go ahead and dig in. Okay, doc. so my collard greens uh, were planted the very first week of May, which is a little bit late for spring planting. So I'm in the U.S. I garden in Chicago, Illinois. My growing zone is six. My average last frost date is April the 18th. So last year I actually planted collard green transplants a full month in advance. But these did just fine. I ended up with three plants. There's a, a story to tell around that. I'll link the video if you're interested. But I ended up with three collard green transplants. I purchased them from a big box store, your home improvement stores. I've had the hardest time starting brassicas from seed. I did have one success, two, three successes this fall. But let's not get distracted. Let's focus. All right. So these collard greens have been growing going back from the first week of May to where we are now, which is basically the last week of November. And I have kept it pretty simple. Typically, I plant my greens at about 18 inches apart, plant them basically to the depth that they were in the container that I pulled them out of. And um, I do, well, not I don't do this for every crop, but for my collards and my brass, because I do try to rotate them. So this year they were growing in this bed behind me. Uh, last year they were in the bed over there in the corner that's under plastic right now. And so they'll move around in my garden just to try to avoid disease kind of year over year. Um, so throughout the planting, I, for the first time, actually put in some granular fertilizer. Um, it's just your typical fertilizer that you'd pull from, again, any home improvement store or nursery. So I put probably about a handful of that with a combination of blood meal, like in the plant hole for each plant. Uh, got them situated, watered well. Uh, one of the things that I try to do with all of my plantings, I don't always get to it, but it's to mulch the beds. And so I mulch them with shredded leaves that I had collected the previous fall. And so they were growing very well over the course of the spring and into summer. Um, while I know this isn't everyone's story, I've been fortunate enough to be able to grow things like collards all throughout the heat of the summer and then back into the fall. Um, so I know some places get too warm, too hot to be able to sustain collard green plants, um, but I've been successful in that way, which I'm uber thankful for. So over the course of the season, I'm gonna say I came back in maybe once, maybe once and fertilized again, kind of top dressed with the granular fertilizer. Um, and then I probably had one or two applications of fish and seaweed uh, fertilizer, liquid fertilizer. But I've not really been diligent over the years when it comes to fertilizing. And I say that to say, um, even without doing that over the years, I've still had success with growing this particular vegetable and some others as well. So when it came to harvest time, um, I am taking on a new mantra for the new growing season. It's gonna be harvest early and often, and that's for everything in my garden. This is a batch of greens that I pulled out. And I get this question, so I wanna cover off on it. I'm gonna say that this is a real ideal size of a green to harvest. Sometimes I'll also recommend, like take a look at what they look like in the store, and that's a good gauge. I also sometimes say like dinner plate size is a good size. Um, but I typically end up with collard greens that are more like this size, right? And so this leaf has some damage and we'll talk about why, but they end up being more like this size. And the warning against greens that are that big is sometimes they end up being tough um, and maybe even bitter. That's not been my experience when it comes to what I'm growing in my garden. Um, I've always basically cooked these up and they end up being tender. Um, but I want to kind of go into the next garden season and harvest more often because I know I'll get more from the plant. Um, so I wanna cover off on, let's see, 
planting, spacing, um, harvesting. Let's talk about pest control. Um, so there are a couple of different pests that I see in my garden for collards. The biggest pest, and I've talked about this in previous videos, is the cabbage moth, which then you know lays eggs and turns into the cabbage worm, and they eat away at the greens. And I have some greens that already have damage from that. This is mild, you can see a couple of holes here, but they can do some real damage when it comes to uh, eating away at the leaves if you don't get them under control. So my number one way to protect my greens against that pest is to use cover. So I have used for a number of years tulle fabric, T-U-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's what you see like for tutus and for veils and things. It's not, it's not at all designed for the garden, but it's been a great resource for the garden. So I have on hoops like this, I'll take the tulle fabric and cover the garden bed and it's just prevention, right? So you don't want to give kind of an open run for the cabbage moth to get to those greens. If she can't get to them, she can't lay eggs then you won't see the worms, you won't have that damage to your greens. Now, with that said, every time I've used tool fabric, I do get one or two outbreaks of the cabbage worm. And I you know, assume that it's based on me removing the cover, her finding her way in, and I'm not necessarily seeing it. Um, but in that case, I focus on hand picking. And so once I start to see the damage, sometimes you see holes in your leaves, sometimes you see poop. Um, I begin hand picking once a day, sometimes twice a day, anytime I see worms for sure. And then about a week is about the time it takes for me to get them under control. I don't use this in my garden, but I've seen and read uh, others have had great success with things like BT um, as a spray, you know, and the note for that has always been when I've read and heard from other gardeners is making sure that you're following the regimen. Typically those things are not successful with kind of just one spray or one application. And then I've also over the years heard people use seven dust. So I'll let you decide how you're going to manage your greens, you know, read up on which method is best you're most comfortable with. For me, it's going to continue to be cover. So the thing I did differently this year, I used instead of my tool fabric, this black netting. And a part of the reason why I liked it so much was because not very obvious in the garden, like you can see the white background behind me. And I like that for my garden. However, probably midsummer, I actually watched multiple cabbage moths make themselves small enough to get into the holes and then ultimately that led to damage to the greens. And so by the time I basically said, okay, I really should be transitioning back to my fabric cover, the greens were pretty large and I just said, all right, we're gonna manage through this. So that's what we, we ended up doing, ending the season basically with the same um, netting here. Now the netting I still love, I'll use it in other places in my garden. I'm pretty sure I'll be using that to protect some of my tomatoes next year. But for my brassicas and specifically my collards, I'm going to go back to my tulle fabric. And then I also have uh, more traditional row covers. Um, so floating row covers, I have some of those as well. And that's what's actually under the plastic under this bed. Um, so I'm gonna go back to that. And that's probably the biggest lesson learned. I lost a lot of greens leaves this year due to damage. I just couldn't stay on top of um, hand picking and, you know, uh, managing against the cabbage worm. But fortunately, I still have plenty of greens as we wound out the season. So I'm still thankful for that. Um, one note as it relates to other pests. So not as much damage, but more of a nuisance. I had the worst time with aphids this year, as I do most years once we get down to the hotter part of summer going into fall and in previous years i've had trouble with white flies and so in both of those instances i just use a hard spray of the water hose to try to rip myself of them um, for the white flies i have used like a soap spray so just your regular dish soap in a water bottle spraying those um, to try to manage against the white flies and that seems to help. Fortunately, I didn't have that issue this year. So on to the tip. Now I've done this across various vegetables. Anything that you're harvesting that has a root attached or anything that has stems, so my collards, my kale, I've done this with carrots, I've done this with celery, with turnips. Uh, if I need to harvest like right now, and let's say I don't have time to deal with 
you know, managing whatever the vegetable is, right? And I don't want to necessarily put it into my refrigerator, right? So for collards, we know if we buy them from the grocery store, we could easily just put them into plastic bags, put them into the crisper. You can do the same thing with the greens in your garden when you pick them. But because I knew that there was a lot of bug residue on these greens, I didn't really want to put them into my refrigerator with my regular food just yet, right? So I didn't have time in that day. Um, and we had already had our first frost, our first freeze. The greens had been frozen, thawed, which we know is supposed to make them sweeter. Um, but I was basically headed into some days where we would have lows in like 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which we got down to. And you can see behind me, some of these greens are pretty limp. Right. And so I knew I'd want to cook them around now and they wouldn't have time to spring back up, you know, after the kind of that real cold spell. So I ended up coming in late Thursday evening, uh, last Thursday evening and harvesting everything that looked good. And then what I ended up doing is in this bucket, the bottom of it is some water. So I basically keep them in water, the stems in water, um, changing the water once a day and they keep the greens fresh right you know so i've kept them in my basement which is a little bit cooler i wouldn't do this in the heat of the summer and leave them in the middle of the the garden you know i have done this where i just only need a few hours right and so i don't want the vegetables to go limp before i get to them seven days is a bit extreme the most i've gone for collars before has been about three days maybe four so i've done this a bunch of times before with these types of greens but what ends up happening if you go too long is you'll see this right so this green this leaf has some yellowing so i'll end up cutting a lot of this away um, so it's basically kind of a lost part of the vegetable whereas this green which i know i showed a more ideal size this is probably what a lot of people prefer earlier on i was talking about like harvest size this is probably what a lot of people prefer when it comes to the size of their greens um, but this container also has just basically water in it and you can see about how much water i put into it and i can see aphids dead aphids floating around there um, so again kind of supporting the idea. Didn't really want to put those into my refrigerator until I was able to work with them. But today I'll go ahead and give everything a really good wash. I'll cut away anything that's damaged and then I'll get these cooked up. But what I was able to say myself was, is damage to the majority of these greens by that cold spell and or waiting until, you know, probably another few days until they actually completely perk back up. Um, so I hope that this is helpful. I know some of y'all probably already do things like this, but for those that don't, I hope it's helpful for you. If you have any questions about anything I've covered off on today, feel free to drop them below. And I look forward to seeing y'all on the next one.